All About Love by Bell Hooks Chapter 7 Greed Simply Love Beginning of Quote The fading away of greed and hatred is the foundation for liberation. Liberation is the sure heart's release, an understanding of the truth so powerful that there is no turning back from it. Quote by Sharon Salzberg Beginning of Chapter Although we live in close contact with neighbors, masses of people in our society feel alienated, cut off, alone. Isolation and loneliness are central causes of depression and despair, yet they are the outcome of life in a culture where things matter more than people. Materialism creates a world of narcissism, in which the focus of life is solely on acquisition and consumption. A culture of narcissism is not a place where love can flourish. The emergence of the me culture is a direct response to our nation's failure to truly actualize the vision of democracy articulated in our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Left alone in the me culture, we consume and consume with no thought of others. Greed and exploitation become the norm when an ethic of domination prevails. They bring in their wake alienation and lovelessness. Intense spiritual and emotional lack in our lives is the perfect breeding ground for material greed and overconsumption. In a world without love, the passion to connect can be replaced by the passion to possess. While emotional needs are difficult and are often impossible to satisfy, material desires are easier to fulfill. Our nation fell into the trap of patholic, patholic, uh, this book is kicking my butt, Path pathological, <laughs> pathological narcissism in the wake of wars that brought economic bounty while undermining the vision of freedom and justice essential to sustaining democracy. Nowadays, we live in a world where poor teenagers are willing to maim and murder for a pair of tennis shoes or a designer coat. This is not a consequence of poverty. In dire situations of poverty at earlier times in our nation's history, it would have been unthinkable to the poor to murder someone for a luxury item. While it was common for individuals to steal or attack someone in the interest of acquiring resources, money, food, or something as simple as a winter coat, winter coat to warn off the cold, there was no value system in place that made a life less important than the material desire for an inessential object. Whether poor or rich, in the mid-50s, most citizens in, the, in our nation felt it was the best place in the world to live because it was a democracy, a place where human rights mattered. This sense of our nation's vision sustained its citizens and served as the catalyst empowering freedom struggles in our society. In the article, Chicken Little, Cassandra, and the Real Wolf, So Many Ways to Think About the Future, Danella Meadows describes the significance of a visionary standpoint. Quote, a vision articulates a future that someone deeply wants and does it so clearly and compellingly that it summons up the energy, agreement, sympathy, political will, creativity, resources, or whatever to make that vision happen." End quote. Our nation's active participation in global warfare called into question its commitment to democracy both here at home and abroad. That vision was diminished in the wake of the Vietnam War. Prior to the war, a hopeful vision of justice and love had been evoked by the civil rights struggle, the feminist movement, and sexual liberation. However, by the late 70s, after the failure of radical movements for social justice aimed at making the world a democratic, peaceful place where resources could be shared and a meaningful life could become a possibility for everyone, folks stopped talking about love. The loss of lives at home and abroad had created economic plenty while leaving in its wake devastation and loss. Americans were asked to sacrifice the vision of freedom, loss, and justice, and put in its place the worship of materialism and money. This, this vision of society upheld the need for imperialistic war and injustice. A great feeling of despair gripped our nation when the leaders who had led struggles for peace, justice, and love were assassinated. Psychologically, we were in despair even as economic booms opened up for jobs for women and men from previously disenfranchised groups. Instead of looking for justice in the public world, individuals turned to their private lives, seeking a place of solace and escape. Initially, a lot of folks turned inward to family relationships to find again a sense of connection and stability. Coming face to face with rampant lovelessness in the home created an overwhelming sense of cultural brokenheartedness. 
Not only did individuals despair about their capacity to change the world, they began to feel enormous despair about their ability to make positive changes in the emotional fabric of their daily lives. Divorce rates were the primary indicators that marriage was not a safe haven, and mounting public awareness of the extent to which domestic violence and all manner of child abuse were widespread, widespread clearly revealed that the patriarchal family could not offer sanctuary. Confronted with a seemingly unmanageable emotional universe, some people embraced a new Protestant work ethic, convinced that a successful life would be measured by how much money one made and the goods one could buy with this money. The good life was no longer to be found in community and connection. It was to be found in accumulation and the fulfillment of hedonistic, materialistic desire. In keeping with this shift in values from a people-oriented to a thing-oriented society, the rich and famous, particularly movie stars and singers, began to be seen as, only, as the only relevant cultural icons. Gone were the visionary political leaders and activists. Suddenly, it was no longer important to bring an ethical dimension to the work life. Making money was the goal, and by whatever means, widespread and base of corruption undermined any chance that a love ethic would resurface and restore hope. By the late 70s, among privileged people, the worship of money was expressed by making corruption acceptable and the ostentatious parading of material luxury the norm. To many people, our nation's acceptance of corruption as the new order of the day began with unprecedented exposure of presidential dishonesty and the lack of ethical and moral behavior in the White House. This lack of ethics was explained away by government officials linking support of big business to further imperialism with national security and dominance globally. This coincided neatly with the decline of the influence of institutionalized religion, which had previously provided moral guidance. The church and temple became places where a materialistic ethic was supported and rationalized. <whistles> Among the poor and other underclasses, the worship of money became most evident by the unprecedented increase in the street drug industry, one of the rare locations where capitalism worked well for a few individuals. Quick money, often large amounts made from drug sales, allowed the poor to satisfy the same material longings as the rich. While the desired objects might have differed, the satisfaction of acquisition and possession was the same. Greed was the order of the day. Mirroring the dominant capitalist culture, a few individuals in poor communities prospered, while the vast majority suffered endless unsa unsatisfied cravings. Imagine a mother living in poverty who has always taught her children that the difference between right and wrong, who has taught them to value being honest because she wants to provide them with a moral and ethical universe, who suddenly accepts a child selling drugs because it brings into the home financial resources for both necessary and unnecessary expenses. Her ethical values are eroded by the intensity of longing and lack, but she no longer sees herself as living at odds with the consumer culture she lives in. She has become connected one with the culture of consumption and driven by its demands. Love is not a topic she thinks about. Her life has been characterized by a lack of love. She has found it makes life easier when she hardens her heart and turns her attention toward more attainable goals, acquiring shelter and food, making ends meet, and finding ways to satisfy desires for little material luxuries. Thinking about love may simply cause her pain. She and hordes of women like her have had enough pain. She may even turn to addiction to experience the pleasure and satisfaction she never found with when seeking love. Widespread addiction in both poor and affluent communities is linked to our psychotic lust for material consumption. It keeps us unable to love. Fixating on wants and needs, which consumerism encourages us to do, promotes a psychological state of endless craving. This leads to an anguish of spirit and torment so intense that intoxicating substances provide release and relief while bringing in their wake the problem of addiction. Millions of our nation's citizens are addicted to alcohol and legal and illegal drugs. In poor communities, where addiction is the norm, there is no culture of recovery. The poor who are addicted and who lack the means to indulge their habit are caught in the grip of major physical and emotional suffering. Addicts want release from pain. They are not thinking about love. In Stanton Peel's useful book, Love and Addiction, he makes the insightful point that, quote, addiction is not about relatedness, end quote. Addiction makes love impossible. Most addicts, most addicts are primarily concerned with acquiring and using their drug, whether it be alcohol, cocaine, heroin, sex, or shopping. 
Hence, addiction is both a consequence of widespread lovelessness and a cause. Only the drug is sacred to an addict. Relationships of intimacy and closeness are destroyed as the addicted individual participates in a greedy search for satisfaction. Greed characterizes the nature of this pursuit because it is unending. The desire is ongoing and can never be fully satisfied. Of course, the ravages of, addict the ravages of addiction are more glaringly obvious in the lives of the poor and dispossessed because they have neither the means to engage in the cover-up so effectively employed by privileged addicts nor the access to recovery programs. When the case against O.J. Simpson was national news, there was little discussion of the role substance abuse played in facilitating the emotional estrangement in an already dysfunctional family. While domestic violence was highlighted, and everyone agrees that it was not acceptable behavior, substance abuse was not. It was not seen as a major factor that destroyed the conditions needed for positive emotional interaction. For example, it, it was not acceptable for anyone to talk compassionately, in a manner that did not blame the victim, about the possibility that Nicole Simpson had kept herself and her children in a dangerous, life-threatening environment, in part because she was not willing to sacrifice her attachment to a superficially glamorous lifestyle among the rich and famous. Behind the scenes, when they are not afraid of being seen as politically incorrect, women who are bonded with abusive, rich, and powerful men talk easily about their addiction to power and wealth. Both men and women remain in dysfunctional, loveless relationships when it is materially opportune. All over this nation, greed motivates individuals to place themselves in life-threatening situations. Our prisons are full of people whose crimes were motivated by greed, usually the lust for money. While this lust is the natural response of anyone who has totally embraced the values of consumerism, when these individuals harm others in their pursuit of wealth, we are encouraged to see their behavior as aberrant. We are all encouraged to believe they are not like us, yet studies show that many people are willing to lie to gain monetary advantage. Most people are tempted by longings to endlessly consume or to try to acquire wealth by any means. In recent years, the public support of gambling, both in lotteries and casinos, has heightened the awareness that desire for money can be addictive. Yet the fact that large numbers of working and middle-class people gamble away their hard-earned incomes in the hope of becoming wealthy is never national news. Many of these hardworking citizens lie and cheat other family members to sustain their habit. While they will not be arrested or put in prison, their, defunctional, their dysfunctional behavior undermines the trust and care in families. They have more in common with prisoners who risk everything in the hope of making easy money than they have with family members who want loving connection to be more important than the lust for material success. In The Seven Laws of Money, Michael Phillips calls attention to the fact that most of the prisoners he encountered, incarcerated for stealing as they attempted to get rich quick, were smart, industrious individuals who could have worked and attained material wealth. Working daily to earn money would have taken time. Significantly, the combination of the lust for material wealth and the desire for immediate satisfaction are signs that this materialism has become addictive. The need for instant gratification is a component of greed. This same politics of greed is at play when folks seek love. They often want fulfillment immediately. Genuine love is rarely an emotional space where needs are instantly gratified. To know genuine love, we have to invest time and commitment. As John Wellwood reminds us in Journey of the Heart, The Path of Conscious Love, quote, Dreaming that love will save us, solve all our problems, or provide the steady state of bliss or security only keeps us stuck in a wishful fantasy, undermining the real power of the love which is to transform us." End quote. Many people want love to function like a drug, giving them an immediate and sustained high. They want to do nothing, just passively receive the good feeling. In patriarchal culture, men are especially inclined to see love as something they should receive without expending effort. More often than not, they do not want to do the work that love demands. When the practice of love invites us to enter a place of potential bliss that is at the same time a place of critical awakening and pain, many of us turn our backs to love. All the widespread emphasis on dysfunctional relationships in our society could easily lead to the assumption that we are a nation committed to ending dysfunction, committed to creating a culture where love can flourish. The truth is, we are a nation that normalizes dysfunction. The more attention focused on dysfunctional bonds, the more the message that families are all a bit messed up becomes commonplace and the greater the notion becomes that this is just how families are. 
like hedonistic consumption, we are encouraged to believe that the excesses of the family are normal and that it is abnormal to believe that one can have a functional loving family. This is the outcome of living in a culture where the politics of greed are normalized. The message we get is that everybody wants to have more money to buy more things, so it is not problematic if we lie and cheat a bit to get ahead. Unlike love, desires for material objects can be satisfied instantly if we have the cash or the credit card handy, or even if we are just willing to sign the papers that make it so we can get what we want now and pay more later. Concurrently, when it comes to matters of the heart, we are encouraged to treat partners as though they were objects we can pick up, use, and then discard and dispose of at will, with the one criteria being whether or not individualistic desires are satisfied. When greedy consumption is the order of the day, dehumanization becomes acceptable. Then, treating people like objects is not only acceptable, but is required behavior. It's the culture of exchange, the tyranny of marketplace values. Those values inform attitudes about love. Cynicism about love leads young adults to believe there is no love to be found and that relationships are needed only to the extent that they satisfy desires. How many times do we hear someone say, well, if that person is not satisfying your needs, you should get rid of them. Relationships are treated like Dixie cups. <laughs> Dixie cups. <laughs> they are the same. They are disposable. If it does not work, drop it, throw it away, get another. Committed bonds, including marriage, cannot last when this is the when this is the prevailing logic, and friendships or loving community cannot be valued and sustained. Most of us are unclear about what to do to protect and strengthen caring bonds when our self-centered needs are not being met. Most people wish they could find love where they are, in their lives and the relationships they have chosen, but they feel they lack useful strategies for maintaining these bonds. They turn to mass media for answers. Increasingly, the mass media is the primary vehicle for the promotion and affirmation of greed. There is little information offered about the establishment and maintenance of meaningful relationships. If the will to accumulate is not already present in the television watcher or the moviegoer, then it will be implanted by images that bombard the psyche with the message that consuming with others, not connection, should be our goal. Nowadays, we go to a movie and must watch commercials first. The relaxed, receptive state of surrender we like to reserve for the pleasure of entering into the aesthetic space of a film in a dark theater is now given over to the advertising, where our sentence our sense and our sensibilities are assaulted against our will. Greed is rightly considered a deadly sin because it erodes the moral values that encourage us to care for the common good. Greed violates the spirit of connectedness and community that is natural to human survival. It wipes out individual recognition of the needs and concerns of everyone, replacing this awareness with harmful self-centeredness. Healthy narcissism, the self-acceptance, self-worth, that is the cornerstone of self-love, is replaced by a pathological narcissism, wherein only the self matters, that justifies any action that enables the satisfying of desires. The will to sacrifice on behalf of another, always present when there is love, is annihilated by greed. No doubt this explains our nation's willingness to deprive poor citizens of government-funded social services while huge sums of money fuel the ever-growing culture of violent imperialism. The profiteering profits of greed are never content. It is not enough for this country to, to be consumed by a politics of greed. It must become the natural way of life globally. Generosity and charity mili militates against the proliferation of greed, whether it takes the form of kindness to one's neighbor, creating a progressive system of job sharing, or supporting state-funded welfare programs. When the politics of greed become a cultural norm, all acts of charity are wrongly seen as suspect and are represented as a gesture of the weak. As a consequence, our nation's citizens become less charitable every day, arrogantly defending self-serving policies which protect the interests of the rich by claiming that the poor and needy have not worked hard enough. I have been astonished by hearing individuals who inherited wealth in childhood warn against sharing money in order to appreciate its value. Inherit Oh, what? I, I read that wrong. Uh, I have been astonished by hearing individuals who inherited wealth in childhood warn against sharing resources because people needing help should work for money in order to appreciate its value. There we go. 
Inherited wealth and or substantial material resources are rarely talked about in the mass media because those who receive it do not wish to validate the idea that money received that is not a reward for hard work is beneficial. Their acceptance and use of this money to strengthen their economic self-sufficiency exposes the reality that working hard is rarely the means by which enough of us can gain enough access to material resources to become wealthy. One of the ironies of the culture of greed is that the people who profit the most from earnings they have not worked to attain are the most eager to insist that the poor and working classes can only value material resources attained through hard work. Of course, their class interests and lessens their accountability. Oh, whoops. Of course, they are merely establishing a belief system that protects their class interests and lessens their accountability to those who are without privilege. Marianne Williamson addresses the widespread cynicism about the sharing of resources which threatens the spiritual well-being of our nation in The Healing of America. Williamson contends, quote, There is so much injustice in America, and such a conspiracy not to discuss it, and so much suffering, and so much deflection lest we notice. We are told that these problems are secondary, or that it would cost too much to fix them, as though money is what matters most. Greed is considered legitimate now, while brotherly love is not." End quote. Although Williamson is a New Age guru, her, courageousness, her courageous willingness to talk about the unacceptable did not diminish her popularity. Most readers simply chose to overlook this particular book. In it, she challenges us to resist, to dare to change injustice, without denying that she is privileged. She calls herself and us to task for not sharing the wealth. Everyone finds it difficult to resist the dictates of greed. Letting go of material desires may compel us to enter the space where our emotional wants are exposed. When I interviewed popular rap artist Lil Kim, I found it fascinating that she had no interest in love. While she spoke articulately about the lack of love in her life, the topic that most galvanized her attention was making money. I came away from our discussion awed by the reality that a young black female from a broken home with less than a high school education, could struggle against all matter of barriers and accumulate material riches, yet be without hope that she could overcome the barriers blocking her from knowing how to give and receive love. The culture of greed validates and legitimizes her worship of money. It is not at all interested in her emotional growth. Who cares if she ever knows, wait, who cares if she ever knows love? Sadly, like so many Americans, she believes that the pursuit and attainment of wealth will compensate for all her emotional lack. Like so many of our nation's citizens, she does not pay close attention to the mass media messages that tell us about the emotional suffering of the rich. If money really made up for loss and lovelessness, the wealthy would be the most blissful people on the planet. Instead, we would do well to remember again the prophetic lyrics sung by the Beatles, money can't buy me love. Ironically, the rich who grow greedier and overprotective of their wealth are increasingly as perpetually stressed and dissatisfied as the greedy poor who suffer endless cravings. The rich cannot get enough, they cannot find contentment, yet everyone wants to emulate the rich. In The Freedom of Simplicity, Richard Foster writes, Think of the misery that comes into our lives by our restless gnawing greed. We plunge ourselves into enormous debt and then take two and three jobs to stay afloat. We uproot our families with unnecessary moves just so we can have a more prestigious house. We grasp and grab and never have enough. And most destructive of all, our flashy cars and sports spectaculars and backyard pools have a way of crowding out much interest in civil rights or inner city poverty or the starved masses of India. Greed has become a way of severing the cords of compassion." End quote. Indeed, we ignore the starving masses in this society the 38 million poor people whose lives are testimony to our nation's failure to share resources in a charitable and equitable manner. The worship of money leads to a hardening of the heart, and it can lead any of us to condone, either actively or passively, the exploitation and dehumanization of ourselves and others. Much has been made of the fact that so many 60s radicals went on to become hardcore capitalists, profiting by the system they once critiqued and wanted to destroy. But no one assumes responsibility for the shift in values that made the peace and love culture turn toward the profit, the politics of profit and power. That shift came about because 
the free love that flourished in the utopian communal hippie enclaves, where everyone was young and carefree, did not take root in the daily lives of ordinary working and retired people. Young progressives committed to social justice who had found it easy to maintain radical politics when they were living on the edge, on the outside, did not want to do the hard work of changing and reorganizing our existing system in ways that would affirm the values of peace and love, or democracy and justice. They fell into despair, and that despair made capitulation to the existing so social order the only place of comfort. It did not take long for this generation to find out that they love material comfort more than justice. It was one thing to spend a few years doing without comfort to fight for justice, for civil rights, for non-white people and women of all races, but it was quite another to consider a lifetime where one might face material lack or be compelled to share resources. When many of the radicals and or hippies who had rebelled against excess privilege began to raise children, they wanted them to have the same access to material privilege they had known, as well as the luxury of rebelling against it. They wanted them to be materially secure. Concurrently, many of the radicals and or hippies who had come from backgrounds of material lack were also eager to find a world of material plenty that would sustain them. Everyone feared that if they continued to support a vision of communalism, of sharing resources, that they would have to make do with less. Lately, I have sat around dinner tables with fancy food and drink dismayed as I listened to reform radicals joke about the fact that they would never have imagined years ago that they would become social liberals and fiscal conservatives, people who want to end welfare while promoting and supporting big business. Williamson makes this insightful point, quote, The backlash against welfare in America today is not really a backlash against welfare abuse so much as it is a backlash against compassion in the public sphere, while America is full of those who would police our private morals, there is far too little questioning of societal morals. We are among the richest nation on earth, yet we spend a trivial amount on our poor compared to that spent by every other Western industrialized nation. One-fifth of America's children live in poverty. Half of our African-American children live in poverty. We are the only industrialized Western nation that does not have universal health care. End quote. These are the truths no one wants to face. Many of our nation's citizens are afraid to embrace an ethics of compassion because it threatens their security, brainwashed to believe that they can only be secure if they have more than the next person. They accumulate and still feel insecure because there is always someone who has accumulated more. We are all witnessing the ever-widening gap between the rich and the poor, between the have and the have-nots. Those with cleft class privilege live in neighborhoods where affluence and abundance are made explicit and are celebrated. The hidden cost of that affluence is not apparent, however. We need not witness the suffering of the many so that the few may live in a world of excessive luxury. I once asked a rich man, who had only recently attained his status, what he liked most about his new wealth. He said that he liked seeing what money can make people do, how it can make them shift and violate their values. He personified the culture of greed. His pleasure in being wealthy was grounded in the desire to not only have more than others, but to use that power to, to degrade and humiliate them. To maintain and satisfy greed, one must support domination, and the world of domination is always a world without love. We are all vulnerable. We have all been tempted. Even those of us committed to an ethic of love are sometimes tempted by greedy desires. These are dangerous times. It is not just the corrupt who fall sway to greed. Individuals with good intentions and kind hearts can be swept away by unprecedented access to power and privilege. When our president exploits his power and cons consensually seduces a young woman in the government's employ, he gives public expression to this greed. His actions reveal a willingness to place all he holds dear at risk for the satisfaction of hedonistic pleasure. That so many of our nation's citizens felt his misuse of power was simply the way things are done, that he simply had the misfortune to get caught, is further testimony that the politics of greed are condoned. They exemplify the greedy mindset that threatens to consume our capacity to love and with it our capacity to sacrifice on behalf of those we love. Concurrently, the young woman involved manipulates facts and details and ultimately prostitutes herself by selling her story for material gain because she is greedy for fame and money, 
and society condones this get-rich-quick scheme. Her greed is even more intense because she also wants to be seen as a victim. With the boldness of any con artist working the capitalist addiction to fantasy, she attempts to rewrite the script of her consensual exchange of pleasure so that it can appear to be a love story. Her hope is that everyone will be seduced by the fantasy and will ignore the reality that deceit, betrayal, and a lack of care for the feelings of others can never be a place where love will flourish. This is not a love story. It is a public dra dramatization of the politics of greed at play, a greed so intense it destroys love. Greed subsumes love and compassion. Living simply makes room for them. Living simply is the primary way everyone can resist greed every day. All over the world, people are becoming more aware of the importance of living simply and sharing resources. While communism has suffered political defeat globally, the politics of communalism continue to matter. We can all resist the temptation of greed. We can all, we can work to change public policy, electing leaders who are honest and progressive. We can turn off the television set. We can show respect for love. To save our planet, we can stop thoughtless waste. We can recycle and support ecologically advanced survival strategies. We can celebrate and honor communalism and interdependency by sharing resources. All these gestures show a respect and a gratitude for life. When we value the delaying of gratification and take responsibility for our actions, we simplify our emotional universe. Living simply makes loving simple. The choice to live simply necessarily enhances our capacity for love. It is the way we learn to practice compassion, daily affirming our connection to a world community. End of chapter.